So a few next steps associated with this line of work. Um, so right now I'm, I'm uh, trying hard to write up an article in BAMS on uh, uh, deep learning for climate science. So I, I showed you a few flavors of problems. Uh, we've also done some other work on um, uh, predicting, I mean, grid level predicting, uh, prediction of whether weather fronts exist or not, and type of weather fronts that's coming along. So anyway, so we'll type this up soon. On the machine learning method side, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is treated as an instantaneous classification problem. I mean, there's no temporal evolution of these um, of these patterns. So using LSTMs or RNNs to explicitly account for temporal evolution is something we are considering. I believe that we are very, very close to semantic segmentation. So, you know, given a CAM5 image, uh, we can pull out pixels that correspond to atmospheric rivers. Instead of just even a box, we can do pixel level, uh, we can get pixel level information. So, uh, so that, uh, I think on the climate science side, opens up a lot of possibilities. Because uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do for my PhD work, I guess whenever I, I get around to that, um, is to pull out uh, extreme precipitation conditional on events. So, um, uh, so with, with pixel level information, you can now, you know, I mean, that, that certainly becomes practical, which is not, not possible right now. So, anyway, so, a lot of cool work to do here. Now, I want to reiterate, I guess, one thing, which is our, our goal is to design a single neural network that can find all kinds of patterns in satellite data, in reanalysis products, and you know, conventional climate model output. So uh, I think what, what the computer vision community has now learned after 30 years of experimentation is the more data, the more high quality catalogs you can provide to it, the better the deep learning system is going to be. I think it's just a matter of time before the, the climate science community realizes that uh, convolution networks are the way to go. So I think the time for coming together as a community and creating these labeled data sets, I think is going to be critical if we want to improve the quality of these networks. But in the end, I think we want to have a single network, similar to ImageNet, that can find patterns. And, um, and I, I think we're just starting to talk to Sangam about maybe uh, making a reference implementation of what we have so far available to the community, and then think about mechanisms like the ESGF that we have in DOE, but of course at NASA you have mechanisms for deploying data sets as well. So having a ground truth catalog data sets available just for the purpose of machine learning, I think it's going to be helpful. So anyway, so I think it's time that the community sort of self-organized and thought about creating this data set. Uh, maybe even running some labeling campaign so that we can, we can have more uh, labeled data. All right. So I'm going to shift tracks now and, and uh, maybe touch about computer science topics, which may or may not be of interest, I think, to most of this audience. But, um, but I think just to give you a flavor of where the state of the art is right now. So the, the challenge really in, in uh, deep learning, I mean, there are many challenges, but one practical challenge is, is scaling and performance. Um, so if you have, say, a 10 terabyte size data set, uh, it can take you days and sometimes weeks to get these networks to converge to something uh, reasonable. Uh, that's a big, big problem, because as I mentioned in the CAM5 quarter degree example, we have tens of terabytes right now. It's not science fiction. Uh, these data sets are here now. So if these networks have to work at, at this scale, then we somehow have to get these to, to run faster. I mean, if you're not, if, you're gonna, if it's going to take you a week to converge the network, then there is no experimentation pretty much that you can do. Um, so in particular, uh, you know, earlier on, I think I mentioned something about this hybrid parameter tuning problem, like how do you decide what architecture you want to use? You have to decide. I mean, you have to make calls on what sort of layers you want to have, how many filters, um, what sort of non-linearities you want to have in the network, learning rates and optimizers and so on and so forth. So at least you know, 50 different combinations you can come up with. And if one combination takes you a week to execute, there's just no way that you'll be experimenting. So chances are that you'll end up with something that's suboptimal. And that's just not, I don't think it does justice to the science side and preparing the data, and it doesn't do justice to the, the computer science side either. So anyway, so this is sort of a well-posed problem for you know, computer scientists to come in and save the data. Uh, so, uh, so far, I think what I'm going to present next, um, this is the software stack that we ended up using. So basically, we coded up our semi-supervised architecture in CAFE, and then we use um, Intel's new uh, uh, machine learning scalability library uh, for multi-node communications. And then we used uh, MKL for uh, single node optimization. This is analogous to CoDNN that you might, might have heard of. And then our hardware is, is all uh, nice landing. So we are actually not going to be using GPUs, which are more conventionally used for uh, deep learning, but we'll be using nice landing. So why? Um, so this is the NERSC uh, 
machine room, I guess, in, in a, schematic, a schematic form. So Cori is going to be the supercomputer where we'll be attempting these scaling experiments. So this is a Prey XC40 system. And um, uh, right now it has about 9,600 uh, night standing nodes. Uh, so in theory, it's, it's a 30 petaflop class system. And uh, it has uh, a burst buffer, uh, an SSD pool of memory that's about 1.5 petabytes in size and can support, support high, high rate uh, uh, I.O. So the, the bandwidth is, is quite good. And there are a bunch of other things. But for this experiment, uh, Cori with, with night standing is the, is the target platform. So uh, the input data for, uh, for this particular setup is um, our image patches are 768 by 768 by 16 channels. Uh, so in aggregate, it's, it's 15 terabytes. We have 400,000 images. And then uh, you know, a bunch of convolution and deconvolution layers. Um, so I try to keep it as, as realistic as possible. Um, so I mentioned uh, uh, single load target. The, the target hardware is nice landing. Um, there are a bunch of things that we had to do to get uh, this to work well. So um, a bunch of low-level deep learning primitives were not quite there in the MKL implementation, so we fixed all of that. And uh, essentially, uh, on a single node, uh, we can get one to four teraflops. So um, these are different layers in the network. So you load the data, you convolve it, you deconvolve it. Um, these bars in black are uh, the teraflop level that you're able to achieve. So generally, if you look at these bars, you know they range from one to maybe three and a half or so teraflops. That's the, the range we can achieve. And then these red stars are just um, the amount of time that is being spent in different layers. So you, you don't spend an equal amount of time in, in layers. So, so, anyway, so I think on a single node level, the, the performance is, is, is fairly good. Um, but really, the, the challenge is, I mean, now that we've extracted all we can from a single CPU, uh, question is how to use about 9,600 nodes, and that's what we have. Um, so on the multi-node side, uh, there are a few options for, for scaling. Uh, one is uh, data parallelism versus mod parallelism. You take your data set, break it up into pieces, and have one node chew on one piece of the data set. Or you have maybe the same data set available to all the nodes, uh, but you take the network and break up the network, so that's called model parallelism. So in this case, we're going to go with data parallelism. That's the, the that's going to be our strategy. So if you go with data parallelism, um, uh, you have a few choices on, on how you uh, how you parallelize things. I'll get into detail, but but at a very high level, uh, there's a question of how do you synchronize parameter updates? Uh, how do you um, lay out various groups? Uh, and, and something to do with updates as well. Uh, but in, in this case, we, we ended up using the Intel MLSL library for handling all of the communication. It turns out that communication is a big bottleneck when you do this multi-node scaling. So MLSL is what we ended up using. All right, so at a, at a high level, and I, I guess I now realize that maybe this is more computer science focused than it should be. Uh, but I, I think at, at, uh, at a high level, there are maybe two extremes that you can think about in scaling deep learning in this data panel paradigm. One is that each node has its piece of data that it's going to try to uh, update. Um, and essentially what you can do is, as each node is done with processing its data set, uh, they can all communicate. They can all block and communicate with each other, uh, update their weights, and then move on uh, to the next uh, next piece of data set, next piece of data. So this is the, you know, uh, the block synchronous all reduce model, where everyone in every single iteration is, is totally perfectly synchronized with each other. The other option is to be completely asynchronous. So everyone processes a mini batch, a portion of the data set, and as soon as it's done, it just broadcasts its weight updates to an asynchronous server, and that's going to broadcast it uh, 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 to, to other worker nodes. So there are trade-offs with, uh, with, with both of these. Uh, in many ways, the synchronous scheme will give you the the same answer as a serial uh, as a serial implementation. Uh, asynchronous, really, all bets are off with regards to statistical divergence. You don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the synchronous scheme is is subject to um, nodes node failures. So if one of the nodes fails, then you're in trouble. Or if one of the nodes is running slow, then, then that's an issue. Uh, the asynchronous scheme does not suffer from from that. So, anyways, I think the the key observation here is really that you know one doesn't have to choose one extreme or the other. 
Um, it doesn't have to be fully synchronous or fully asynchronous. You can come up with a hybrid. And essentially, that's the strategy that we ended up using for, uh, for scaling it on, on our machine. So essentially, you have tight synchronous groups that are updating weights. Uh, and then occasionally, one of them, one of the nodes in that synchronous group will send its update to an asynchronous parameter server. And that then is going to be responsible for broadcasting the, uh, the updates to, uh, to the rest of the compute groups. All right. So I'm going to skip this. Uh, I guess I'll, so th these are the scaling results. So, um, um, so this is the strong scaling setup wherein you fix the prompt size and then you throw more and more nodes at the prompt. So starting from 256 nodes all the way up to 1024 nodes. And essentially what you see is no, no surprise here, but um, that the synchronous model will essentially saturate at some point. So around 512 nodes is when it saturates. So beyond that point, it makes no sense to keep throwing more nodes at the prompt. Uh, but the hybrid strategy indeed is able to scale better. So that's, that's a good sign. Um, so we, we, uh, you know, we had proof that uh, the hybrid strategy had promised, so that's what we used for some of the weak scaling configurations. Um, so in this case, you increase the prompt size as you throw more nodes at the prompt. And um, in, an, in some sense, the synchronous does scale, but the hybrid is scaling even better. So, um, so that's what we, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ignore convergence for the time being, it's, it's for the statisticians, I think, in the audience. Uh, but uh, this is what we get overall. Um, so on a single KNL node, we can get one to four teraflops, which is, which is competitive. But uh, on the entire machine, 9,600 KNL nodes, uh, we can get uh, 13 petaflops sustained and 15 petaflops speed. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, co compared to a single load implementation, it's a significant speed up, so that's, uh, that's promising. So this, I believe, is, is uh, the most uh, state-of-the-art, the most scalable deep learning solution at this point in time. Um, I think typical GPU results that we've heard of have been in the 100 GPU load range. Um, uh, but as far as I know, I think this is a uh, you know, real application running at scale and achieving a fairly significant fraction of the peak capacity of the system. All right, so sorry, this is more maybe computer science than you wanted, but I, I guess I, you know, these are late-breaking results, so we, we wanted to share them with you. All right, so I'm going to just step back now from uh, the computer science stuff and go back to deep learning for science. So hopefully I think you have a flavor, or you have a sense that convolutional networks can work well for climate problems. But we have actually been using these for many other science applications. I just want to share some again. Yes, question. Well, so you said that you, you are using a lot of you know, efforts for the scaling the challenge. Yes. To try to figure out how to uh, put the multiple saving costs together mm -hmm. to, to, work, to work with this uh, machine learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. so I, I just think you know it's uh, for 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 you currently just use the C CNN model, right? I'm sorry, you just use the the CNN the CNN model. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 So that's for each operation, the computation is uh, very small. You, know, you, you usually just use a three by three filters. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like uh, it's uh, very, very small computation. Mm -hmm. If you use all the CPU in like like your supercomputer to do this work, kind of like you are using. Uh, a huge container just uh, to transport the uh, wire, wire, wire uh, light, uh, you know, uh, 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 fried like like uh, uh, balloons, right? It's uh, kind of weak your computation. So you know these uh, these uh, problems are computationally demanding. Um, so in fact, when we ran this out on uh, 9,600 nodes, mm -hmm. in 10 minutes we could actually only complete one epoch. Um, so there is a lot of compute that needs to be done for these problems. That's kind of, you know, for each each computer, you just uh, do the you know, dot product, right? It's very simple. So at where the end of the day, it does boil down to DGEM style operations, and there are some convolution operations in, in the mix as well. And the, the form factor of the matrix changes. So initially, the matrices are large, but as you go through the network, yeah. uh, the, the shape of the matrix is not easy to, to parallelize. In fact, yeah. you uh, I mean, so even though you, you, your CPU, you know, the frequency is very high, yes. so actually you just use 10%, maybe, maybe one, only 1%, because it's, the computation is, is very low. You, you occupy the CPU, all the CPUs are working, but you just use very low percent for, for your calculation. That's kind of 
so you know, in terms of percentage of peak, so again, uh, the repo we are hitting uh, one to four teraflop on a single load. For KNL, I think six to eight teraflop is, I think, what is achieved. So, uh, so it's not, I would say it's not a bad fraction of peak. Uh, uh, yeah. So, you know, I would say that I think compared to a lot of other data analytics applications which are more irregular, this is definitely a regular application. So, uh, so in that sense, I think utilization of peak is not, not bad. So, but, but there is definitely work to do. So I think you know, one just has to be careful. Um, when I mentioned, you know, processing 30 terabytes of data, you have to process that. While it might be simple DGEMs and convolutions and so on, you have to analyze all of that, which is not, uh, not that easy. Want to do that on the GPU? I just don't know. Well, on a single node, I'm just not sure how much it's going to take. Uh, one more question. Yes. You talked about the hybrid model. Yes. For two and four uh, convolutions. Yes. So how is it different from the other convolution models? Well, so the conventional models are uh, <coughs> so fully synchronous. So in the fully synchronous model, what will happen is that all 9,000 nodes will move in lockstep. So after processing their mini batch, they will. Uh, in a lockstep fashion, reduce the gradient updates, update the parameters, sort of thing. Uh, so that's all fully synchronous. The fully asynchronous is everyone does their own thing. I mean, of course, they have the small data that they process, but then the way they communicate the parameters is, is asynchronous. So essentially, what happens is that statistically, it's very tough for the network to converge to an optimal set of parameters. So in the two or the four group model, essentially, what you do is you break the 9,600 nodes into two groups or four groups. And within those groups, you will be synchronous. And then the parameter updates between the groups will happen asynchronously. So that's, I guess, where the hybrid thing comes in. And uh, that's what we end up using. So as far as I know, um, people have uh, run such hybrid models at small scale. So maybe 100 nodes on an Amazon-like system, uh, cloud-like system, but not on an HPC system at this scale before. So there are questions regarding, you know, can you actually get it to converge? Can you get it to run uh, at that scale? So is better than the second? Yes. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so again, just taking a step back, uh, I'll just comment on, you know, what we've learned so far over the last three years on deep learning for science. Uh, what kinds of applications it seems to be working for. Um, so I mentioned the climate, of course, so, you know, detecting uh, extreme weather patterns in simulation data. We are now starting to work on satellite data sets and uh, pulling out uh, patterns in, in satellite data sets as well. Uh, clearly, you're not going to have all the fields that you have in a simulation available in satellite data. So it'll be interesting to see if one can do some transfer learning from the model output to the satellite output and that. So uh, it'll be interesting to conduct that exercise. Uh, but we do have other problems uh, having to do with uh, density estimation or modeling galaxy shapes. So we have a number of projects that look out at the sky and collect uh, in a normative fashion uh, uh, images of the night, night sky. So uh, looking at galaxies and, and the, the kinds of shapes that you have in galaxies and automatically clustering them is, is a problem that we've been looking at. Um, now this is an interesting one. I was, I was chatting earlier in that uh, we now seem to have empirical evidence that uh, you might be able to use a, a deep learning system, so something called a generative adversarial network architecture, to replace an expensive simulation. Uh, so in this case, we run expensive n-body cosmology simulations that take a long time to run. And uh, essentially, I think what we've been able to do is to show that GANs can uh, produce synthetic data that has the same underlying statistics. Uh, some time series problems, I think what I chatted about mostly was convolutional uh, architectures. But you can use LSTM architectures as well. So, uh, so in this case, we have a new Oxford nanopore sequencing device, which gives you time series data as it encounters various strands in, in the DNA. And uh, you can essentially pre predict ATCG from, from that time series data much more accurately than that's, than it's been done before. And the neat thing here is that you can, you can uh, deploy that LSTM architecture on the Oxford nanopore right there in, in situ. Uh, we, are, we are working on decoding speech from ECOG as well. So uh, from an ECOG array, uh, you, you get uh, a time varying signal and you can map it to speech. So that's, uh, that's also looking promising at this point. Now the particle physicists have woken up to this. Uh, so usually they're the first ones to adopt and, and try out new, new techniques. So uh, for the Large Hadron Collider, for discriminating single versus background, uh, particle physics are now getting better results than what the entire field has been using so far. Um, 
So uh, on the precision recall curve, there's substantial improvement. Um, so there, there is, there are discussions in the community on how maybe one could replace the FPGA threshold-based detection logic uh, for the LSC for various detectors by a deep learning system. There are different flavors of devices, of course. So we have the dial instrument in China, and uh, uh, we've been using deep learning both in an unsupervised clustering fashion, but also in a supervised classification sense, and we're getting some good results there. Um, uh, Elise is a certain instrument on the LSC, and we are starting to apply convolution architectures for uh, discrimination tasks there. And then uh, I think a problem, which is maybe that there are analogs to climate science. Um, uh, people are interested in particle tracking, and typically they've been using Kalman filter or ensemble Kalman filters to do this tracking. And uh, now uh, we are starting to use uh, LSTMs as well for, uh, for doing this task. It remains to be seen how, how much better it's, it's going to be. But so far, I think the, the results are promising. All right. So now, how much time do I have? I've lost time of uh, it's of you. OK. All right. So um, I was going to just say that um, you know, this is how I, I, I guess I think about analytics in general and the range of problems that we have in analytics range from you know, classification, regression, so on and so forth. And then we have a number of different domain science areas in, in Agnes and at Berkeley Lab. So I think we now uh, believe that um, deep learning can probably do a really good job at, so if you have enough training data, and that's a big if, but if you do, then deep learning can do probably do a really good job at certainly tackling classification and regression problems. And uh, I think clustering and dimension error reduction look promising. Certainly some promise in replacing expensive simulation by surrogate models, so that's looking good as well. And then uh, text applications for semantic analysis and feature learning. All right, I just want to, I guess, uh, quickly point out some open challenges. So we're not done, of course. Uh, I mean, this is early days of uh, application of deep learning for science and climate science. I mentioned performance and scaling. Uh, you know, right now we've gone to maybe the 10 terabyte size mark, but we have more data. So, uh, so I think we need scalable solutions. Um, I'll note that, and I think this is probably you're, you're quite familiar with, uh, scientific data is complex. It's not simple RGB images. It's not 1D speech data. So we typically have 3D, 4D, multi-channel data, hyperspectral data. Uh, sometimes the data is sparse. It's not necessarily dense. Uh, and sometimes there is a graph structure that's that's native to the, to the data set. So we need to make sure that convolutional architectures will work across this entire flavor of, of problems. I mentioned hyperparameter optimization. So uh, there's no way that domain scientists are going to become an expert in deep learning. That's, that's not happening. Um, so we need automated ways for making sure that uh, we can explore promising architectures and then presenting to the scientists the architecture that works best. I think uh, the scarcity of label data is always going to be a problem. That's true for science. I, I, I really don't see the science community producing curated data sets with millions of images or tens of millions of images. So I think it's really important that we figure out how to get unsupervised learning working where uh, you don't have any label data, but then also semi-supervised learning working where you might have a little bit of label data. So anyway, so I think from a practical perspective, I think this is really important. Now, coincidentally, I think and conveniently for us, uh, the practitioners in deep learning, the, the leading thought leaders, you know, Jan Lagoon and others, they also believe that unsupervised and semi-supervised learning is the frontier for research for deep learning. So I think that's right. Finally, uh, I think um, interpretability and visualization is really important. I think uh, the proposition basically that I think we are making now, uh, I think given the success of deep learning to the, the community is that uh, you, know, you should consider throwing away decades worth of heuristics that you've been developing Uh, so that's a tough, tough call. I, I think you know, some scientists might be fine, but others may not be. Um, so, so really, I think in order to uh, uh, make sure that we can bridge this gap, uh, we need to think about how we constrain the networks to be more uh, representative of physical mechanisms. So for example, there is no notion of laws of physics right now in, in how these networks are trained. Uh, there is, the solutions that they end up with are not physically consistent. So can we somehow uh, incorporate domain science principles uh, to make sure that these networks do the right thing uh, scientifically? All right, so just to conclude last slide, um, I, I do believe that we that there is a phase shift right now. I mean, this is not your routine you know, incremental progress. Um, there's certainly a lot of excitement in the industry, I think for well-justified reasons. 
and I think it's just a matter of time before science wakes up and starts you know, adopting these, these techniques. So in climate science in particular, I think we now convince ourselves that semi-supervised and semi-supervised learning can, can work. So that's looking promising. And on the scaling side, I think we, uh, you know, we, we have some of the state-of-the-art results. Certainly, I think a lot of empirical proof from uh, different science domains, so astronomy, cosmology, neuroscience, genomics, biology, and nuclear physics, that, uh, uh, that these techniques can work and are producing state-of-the-art results. But there are open challenges, clearly, so a lot, lot of work to do. Um, I think I just want to end with this slide, uh, which is, um, I, I don't think it's inconceivable that you know, a place like Nuez or a supercomputing center where there's a lot of computational horsepower, that we have smart AI logic systems, so you know, deep learning, convolution networks, LSTMs, what have you, running on these machines. Of course, the data is right there, so we have HPSS and all our file systems and so on and so forth. So I really don't think it's, it's inconceivable that maybe a few years from now, all data is going to be analyzed and semantically labeled and uh, clustered and, and uh, that these, these techniques will give us patterns and anomalies. So given that that's done, so let's assume for a moment that classification is solved, regression is solved, anomaly detection is solved, and uh, you know all of that data is, 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 uh, is it, all of the patterns are extracted. I think the question really is, you know, what, what is the role of humans in that context? What, what, what is the unique value add that they provide? So first, clearly, the deep learning system cannot um, provide labels. I mean, if, if there is a new category. Uh, a label is a function of human language and, and taxonomy. So humans will always have to provide semantic labels and say, you know, I think that this is a uh, atmospheric river or you know, a heat wave or a derecho or whatever it is. So certainly, I think humans will provide that. But I think maybe more importantly, I think humans will uh, scientists will be more free to think about hypotheses and underlying mechanisms. Right now, I think as I look at nurse and I look at scientists, uh, our user community, they just so bogged down with just. Just the logistics of managing data, right? downloading data, and then curating it, and then analyzing it, and visualizing it, and so on and so forth. Just just getting that whole workflow to work is, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. But if if some through some automated mechanism, I think we can get it to work. Then, given that you know scientists is going to be injecting, I mean, just going to be looking at patterns and clusters and anomalies, I think they can think deeper about uh, underlying hypotheses and mechanisms, and they can ask the question of the deep learning system. Now, I think that this is the most this is the most likely hypothesis. Can you, in a data-driven fashion, verify that hypothesis for me? And then, you know, we just turn through the crank and, and, and give it a result. So, anyway, so I think we are we are probably you know get, getting to that stage uh, sometime soon. All right, a, a bunch of acknowledgments. Clearly, a lot of people have, have contributed to uh, these results, and I'm happy to take any questions. So I'm running also.